In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I want to welcome everyone back to this series of talks on the Catholic faith offered by servants of the Holy Family. I am Father McMahon, and this is the 15th presentation in the series. And today we're going to do Lesson 29, which is on the Sacrament of Penance, and Chapter 30, with, which is on Contrition. So just as a little background or context where we are again, we are going through the three parts of the Catechism, which first is the Creed, the Commandments, and then the Sacraments. And we are in the third part now, which is the Sacraments. And we've been talking about what the Sacraments are. We talked about the first ones. We have just finished the whole talk about the Holy Eucharist, Holy Communion, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, all powerful and beautiful doctrines to think about and pray about. This section is almost a little mini catechism because starting with this one on the Sacrament of Penance is actually a four lesson part of the catechism. So if you think of the complete syllabus being 38 lessons, four out of 38 is, is a big, it's a, over 10% of the catechism is going to be on this Sacrament of Penance and what is necessary for it. So this is an important part of our Christian faith. So lesson 29, penance. Question 379, what is the sacrament of penance? Penance is the sacrament by which sins committed after baptism are forgiven through the absolution of the priest. Now, one of the things that we talk about immediately whenever we talk about the sacrament of penance is this word penance, because it has many meanings. It is, of course, first of all, here in this case, it is the, the sacrament. That is the name of the sacrament. It is also a virtue, a supernatural virtue, by which God, it's a supernatural, so God has to give it to us. We cannot get it ourselves. God gives us this power. It is a supernatural power that enables us to hate sin, and it's particularly the sins that we commit, and gives us the ability to resolve to make up for them, to confess them, and to resolve not to do them again. The also penance is the term we use for the acts that flow from the virtue. So we talk about the acts of penance, and these are the things that are done during Lent to make up for our sins. But the sacrament itself is that, as we were known, we can review, what is a sacrament? It is an outward sign instituted by Christ to give grace. So that's what we're going to be talking about here, the sacrament. When we talk about an outward sign, we've already seen in baptism and the Holy Eucharist confirmation too, those, those are the things we've already studied, that there is in this sign, there are two parts to every sign of these sacraments. One is the matter that is something perceived by our senses, that's what makes it an outward sign. And then there is a form, the words that are giving the meaning to that matter, that outward sign that we're seeing. So baptism is clear with water, we can see that, but it's not just any water, it's the, when the water is being poured, we say, I baptize thee. That's telling us what that washing is doing. Confirmation, same, sacred oil, the, the priest, the bishop, uh, anointing the person, I confirm you with the chrism of salvation. We also have Holy Eucharist, the uh, sacrament par excellence, because here we have the outward sign of the appearances of bread, but we know it is our Lord. So that's the outward sign. Oh, the, the form there is, this is my body, the words of our Lord himself. Here in the sacrament of penance, the outward sign, it's 
It is the confessing, the person telling his sins, that's making it, exhibiting it public or making it outside himself, something perceptible to someone else here would be by hearing. We're making those sins known by saying them. We are also, that's why we're going to see this in these subsequent lessons on penance, the, the importance of the sacrament, the greatness of the sacrament, so maligned and attacked, but it's so beautiful coming from the sacred heart of Jesus because he is giving us the means of regaining his grace after baptism when we have fallen. And so what he does is he is these lessons and break it down for us. First, we talk about the sacrament. We're going to be talking about contrition, that part of the sacrament that gives us the motivation to confess. So we have contrition. I'm now is telling what are the elements of the matter of this sacrament. They are contrition. There's a whole lesson on that, but it's sorrow for sin. That leads us to confession telling those sins and then satisfying for them. This is the, the matter of it, the form, that which gives the meaning to that expression of sorrow is the priest then saying, I absolve you of your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Just so we have that down. We also, by the way, back to the definition, we know now that the outward sign instituted by Christ this is big because this is much maligned, well, through the centuries, but especially today, because many people have been propagandized to think that this is an invention of the church, which immediately means it would not be a sacrament. It might be a sacramental, but it would not be a sacrament because sacraments are instituted by Christ so they say the church over time saw this as a good thing to do and, and other reasons and that they say, which are not true. We just want to say that right away at the beginning here, that it is a sacrament. That is, Christ instituted it. And we're going to see that in some of this. We're going to see that here in, immediately in the quotes. The next, le the next question is going to do that, so we'll hold that for that, that part. Our Lord himself said it, okay. But throughout history, we have seen it. So we see the different bishops and saints and popes, St. Clement, first century, writing to the Corinthians, telling them to confess their sins to their presbyters, their priests. First century. This is within 30 years of the death of St. Peter. We have St. Leo the Great telling the people, this is from apostolic Tradition. In other words, he's telling her, this is we've been, we've had this hand down to us by the apostles that this comes from our Lord. Saint Saint Augustine talking about, and this is just another part about the other addition to what they say. They say the church is due, it's false. This has been condemned. Uh, Saint Pius X, the Pope of the last century, condemned this in his syllabus. He, he talks specifically those people who say this is an inst institution of the church that is condemned. So we have it there. But St. Augustine talks about the fact that there's a corollary to the attack on penance today. The corollary is that the private confessions that we are most used to, where we go to the priest and the confessional, that is something the church invented. In the early, early church, they were all just public, it was just public penance, and this was not the way it was done. The fact is, St. Augustine says it right fourth, fourth. 5th century, St. Augustine, saying it's up to the bishop as to whether or not it's going to be a public confession of sin or private. He's already saying it's going to be up to the bishop to determine that, because he says they're going to be reasoned, but one is, it might scandalize the people that are around to hear all these sins, which makes sense. That's why we have private. Make it easier for people to go to confession. So right, the back, right off, we want to make that clear. Question 380. Whence has the priest the power to forgive sins? This is the scripture coming from our Lord. The priest has the power to forgive sins from Jesus Christ who said to his apostles and to their successors in the priesthood, receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them, and whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. 
Our Lord spoke these words when he met the apostles on Easter Sunday. He reserved giving this sacrament to the moment that they needed it the most. They had just all abandoned him. And now he comes in and the first thing he says to them, peace to you. I am establishing the tranquility of order. That's what peace means. That's what our Lord's saying to them. And then he, he says, he breathes forth the Holy Spirit and said these words. As I, now I gave the words, but you can see the, the dynamic here. Our Lord immediately to them, these people who abandoned him, his closest friends, he immediately is telling them, I have forgiven you. I am restoring order between us, peace. And what I've given to you, I am telling you to give to others with these words. Receive the Holy Spirit whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. Of course, our Lord during his own lifetime was forgiving sins and then he would, he would do a miracle immediately upon that to prove the power of the forgiveness because he was being attacked himself by the Pharisees and the others that who can forgive sins but God alone? How are you going around saying you're forgiving this person's sins? Only God can do that. Of course, our Lord is God. And so he is proving that by saying that you are correct. Only God can do that. And to show you the reality of what you're pointing out, this man, who I just said your sins are forgiven, pick up your bed and, and go. So then the man just stands up and walks away. So if I can do that and heal him, I can do that which you cannot see being done, the forgiveness of sins. So even our Lord is being attacked, but of course he proved it. Number, question 381, with what words does the priest forgive sins? The priest forgives sins with the words, I absolve thee from thy sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. We were just talking about that as the part of the outward sign that gives the form, the meaning to this confession of sin. He goes on to explain here <clears throat> that the uh, power to forgive sins has been given to the priest at his ordination. And subsequent to that, so we've got the power of order that gives him the ability to do that because again, only God can forgive sins. So how is it the Catholic Church says that these men, these priests, are forgiving sins? They are doing it in the per person of God because they are, as well, we'll study in holy orders, uh, they are another Christ. So they have been given that power to do that. So they are forgiving in the person of Christ. So when, when the priest absolves, it's Christ absolving. So it's still the same. God is the one who takes away sin. But he uses his instruments. There are reasons. The reason why our Lord does that, of course, is because the whole basis of the sacramental system is that man, being creature composed of body and soul, had to get to that spiritual side of us. We have to go through the body. We're composed of body and soul. And so the sacraments are God's way of being able to do that. Through these outward signs, we are seeing invisible graces being given to us. That's the greatness of it. And here in the sacrament of penance, People, again, the criticism, I will, I will ask God for my forgiveness directly. Well, where's the guarantee of that? It, it's, it, that is not a human thing to do. Our, the human way is to go through our senses, and our Lord has done that with the sacraments. So when we hear the priest say, I absolve you of your sins, he is speaking in the, in the, with the voice of God. How can we be any doubt about that? I mean, that our sins are forgiven. But also, besides the power of order, he talks out about the fact that the priest also has, has to have the power of jurisdiction. He has to have the authority of God. He has the power already, but he has to have the authority to do that. And usually that authority is given ordinarily through the bishop of a diocese. But, it is, but the fact is, it must always be there. The priest always has to have this jurisdiction. So it's either ordinarily given, the parish priest, the bishop did it to him, the diocese, or someone's given special delegation, or it is delegated to him, as we just mentioned, specially delegated. The church will always, in case, and we can't go through all of the cases, why, the, how the church provides this jurisdiction in, in emergencies or otherwise. But one case, of course, is at the moment of death, any priest 
can forgive sins, can, is given the jurisdiction to do so. So you can see how the church in its maternal care for all of us has control of the keys. So there's a control in this jurisdiction given to priests by their office ordinarily, but in other cases it's delegated. And one example this I, I pick here is this one. If a person is dying and a priest is not from this diocese or he's traveling, he comes across someone who's dying, the church gives him the jurisdiction, which is the interesting thing there. That jurisdiction is given at the instant that the priest gives the absolution. He doesn't have it before that absolution, and he doesn't have it after the absolution. Whereas the priest who has the ordinary delegation, the ordinary jurisdiction, he has it before, during, and after the administration of sacrament penance. It's very interesting. But the fact is that you have to have jurisdiction to forgive sins. He also says some sins are so serious that they, the, the jurisdiction, the delegation, is withheld from the priest. One example that used to be was the case of abortion. Uh, no, not any, every priest could just absolve from the sin of abortion. The priest would have to, someone could confess, the priest would then have to go to the bishop and get the jurisdiction just to take away that sin because it was reserved. Because if the church wanted to impress on everybody, this is a very serious sin. So you can have it for, you can have it forgiven, but because all sins can be forgiven. But we're going to, you have to have special delegation to do that. So that's that's no he put it. Question 382. What are the effects of the sacrament of penance worthily received? The effects of the sacrament of penance worthily received are first the restoration or increase of sanctifying grace, second, the forgiveness of sins, third, the remission of the eternal punishment if necessary, and also a part, at least, of the temporal punishment due to our sins, fourth, the help to avoid sin in the future, and fifth, the restoration of the merits of our good works if they have been lost by mortal sin. You can see there, by the way, the sacrament of penance is primarily for the removal of mortal sins, because that is the thing that is, let me see this. Yes, I didn't stress this enough right at the beginning. When I said, what is the sacrament of penance? It's uh, a sacrament by which sins committed after baptism are forgiven. So that any time a because we come into the world with original sin, we have to have baptism to get rid of that. But besides original sin, there's another kind of sin called actual sin, which we ourselves commit. There are two types, mortal and venial. Mortal is the one that takes away God's life from our soul after baptism. So to get that removed, we have a sacrament of penance to do it. But even though that's the primary end of the sacrament, it also takes away venial sins, obviously. And so that's why in this answer of what is happening, we have the restoration of sanctifying grace in the case of, of having, having committed a mortal sin. We have life restored or increased in the case of venial sins. The removal of eternal punishment, that's the case of mortal sin. And temporal punishment in the case of venial sins. And in the case of mortal sin, we lose, we lose all of our merits when we commit a mortal sin, but they are restored by this sacrament. That's how powerful it is, you can see. Just as an aside, this is one of the reasons why the frequent use of the sacrament of penance is recommended for all kinds of reasons. But here's one right here, just this one right in this thing, about the temporal punishment. We can lessen our time in purgatory by going to the sacrament of penance. Question 383, what else does the sacrament of penance do for us? The sacrament of penance also gives us the opportunity to, re opportunity to receive spiritual advice and instruction from our confessor. This is not the primary thing, but it is a secondary advantage. Question 384, what must we do to receive the sacrament of penance worthily? To receive the sacrament of penance worthily, we must first examine our conscience Second, be sorry for our sins. Third, have the firm purpose of not sinning again. Fourth, 
confess our sins to the priest. Fifth, be willing to perform the penance the priest gives us. Here it is, perform the penance. That's the word being used as an act. We have to do an act of sorrow for sin. That's the act of penance. What is an exact, this is question 385. What is an examination of conscience? An examination of conscience is a sincere effort to call to mind all the sins we have committed since our last worthy confession. Question 386. What, what should we do before our examination, examination of conscience? Before our examination of conscience, we should ask God's help to know our sins and to confess them with sincere sorrow. Question 387. How can we make a good examination of conscience? We can make a good examination of conscience by calling to mind the commandments of God and of the church and the particular duties of our state of life and by asking ourselves how we may have sinned with regard to them. And he says we should do this carefully and thoughtfully in attempting to remember all our sins. Now, I read his question and answers, but I just brought this in, which we all should, are probably familiar with. This is the examination of conscience that we make available to everyone, and it's very popular for all because it does exactly this, telling us how to place ourselves in the presence of God. Here's the first thing, I tell it right here. Look at the crucifix and make, make acts of humility and self-abnegation. Because what is sin? It's an attack on God. Mortal sin, trying to kill God. In fact, our Lord's death on that cross is the result of sin. So that's the first thing that we're thinking of. And it goes through this first section, just talks all about that, reviewing what mortal sin is. And it opens up, reviewing what the three conditions for a mortal sin. And then it goes through the Ten Commandments, the commandments of the church, just as he expressed it here. To help, it also does the seven capital sins and their vices to help us to understand the root causes of why we sin. And then it talks about the sins against the theological virtues. Then the sins against the moral virtues. And then ways of being responsible for the sins of others by counseling them to do so and things like that. And then it gives us the form of the confession, where we say, bless me, Father, how we say that. And it gives us the act of contrition at the end. So this is a very, and if anyone needs it, of course, they can contact us. In the important truths about this lesson, he talks about the fact that the whole sacramental system is to help us in our supernatural life. So it, it mirrors the natural life we have, how we're born, live, and die. And so we see all those elements in the sacramental system. So we're, we're born into the life of God's grace with baptism. We are nourished by the Holy Eucharist. That is our food. Of course, it's our, our Lord himself. It can't be better than that. We are given confirmation, the strength to go out and pr promote this in the world. This sacrament is the medicine that along the way, when we are make mistakes and fall. This is the medicine that cures us to go on. So it's a great sacrament to help us that way. He also talks about the, now the scriptural quote we already gave when our Lord gave the sacrament on Easter, and I gave all the context. That was the fulfillment of what our Lord had implied earlier in his apostolate. And he said this, in, it's recorded in the St. Matthew. That quote I gave earlier was from St. John. But this is from St. Matthew. Because our Lord gave some indication of his purpose to provide such a sacrament when he said to the apostles, and here's the quote from St. Matthew, chapter 18, verse 18, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound also in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed also in heaven. Here is the promise that they have the power to do this. And it will, what they say will go in heaven. That's, they're speaking on behalf of God.
He does talk here because of this external sign of the sacrament that we have to have contrition, which we're about to start talking about here. We have to have confession and satisfaction. These all have to be part of this sacrament. And he says that the priest, it's up to the priest. This is called a sacred tribunal. The person coming in is, putting it into the context of a court. Uh, the person coming in is the criminal. He is also the prosecuting attorney. He is the one that's accusing himself of the crimes. He is already saying he's, he's guilty. He's, he's the judge and jury. And the priest is in the function as a judge, then handing down the sentence. He's taking away the sentence and handing down the sentence and, and giving him the penance to do. That's what's the, the dynamic here. But essential on the part of the priest is, as he puts out here, is that the priest has to be, because the priest is the guardian of the sacraments, he has to make sure that the sacraments are being done correctly so we have validity. So you can just imagine all the sacraments, how the priest has to look out for each of them. We're just talking about this one here. And so the priest has to be a, know that we have to have contrition, we have to have confession, we have to have satisfaction. So that's why people are taught to follow the form, bless me, Father, for I have sinned, to follow that form because it's all contained in there. So the priest can hear the person doing all these things. He's, so he's aware of it. But if at any, in any way, or there's some indication to the priest that something's lacking, he can correct it. The priest is taught to how, to, we say, to dispose the penitent, to, do the, to confess correctly. So sometimes the priest might have to ask a question to get things exactly right. He may have to ask a question not just about confession, but he might have to ask a question about contrition and the resolution to make amendment, satisfaction. He might have to ask a question about that because if the person is confessing a sin and the priest says, oh, okay, well, have you stopped stealing cars? And the person says, well, no, I, I do that for a living. Then the priest has to say, well, is he really sorry? He's not really making an amendment of life, is he? So the priest, again, tries to dispose him. Well, you see, that's not, you see, you're going to have to change your way of life because that's not making God happy. You have to keep coming in here and confessing. That's not real sorrow. So can you get another job? Yes. Then the priest can absolve him. See, the priest has disposed him to be sorry and resolve, make a resolution. But if the person says, well, no, I actually like doing this job, then the priest says, well, you see, he explains it to him. And the person still says no. See, then the priest had, sees the sacrament is not being done correctly. We're missing an element. We're missing contrition. You're not sorry. You, you said you like doing this. So then the priest has to say, well, you see, I'll pray for you, but I cannot give you the sacrament because you are not doing the part you are supposed to do. You're not fulfilling the contrition part of this sacrament. See what's happening there. So he talks about that. Okay, lesson 30, which is on contrition, is a whole lesson on this one aspect of the outward sign. Outward sign has to be contrition, confession, and satisfaction. Here's a lesson just on one third of this outward sign. Question 388, what is contrition? Contrition is sincere sorrow for having offended God and hatred for the sins we have committed with a firm purpose of sinning no more. He goes on to talk about, right, it's, it, it, which I we were just speaking about. It doesn't make any sense to come in to say you're confessing sins when you have no intention of stopping. He says, by sin we offend and insult God. Unless we are sincerely sorry for our sins and firmly resolve not to sin again, we cannot reasonably expect God to forgive us. He gives, as he always does, he gives these beautiful scripture quotes. I will not read this one from St. Luke chapter 15, verses 17 to 24, but we all know the story of the prodigal son, how the son realizes the evil of what he has done, and he says, I will go back to my father, and he will forgive me. And of course, that's what the father does. Let us eat and make merry, because this my son was dead and has come back to life again. He was lost and is found, and they began to make merry. Question 389, will God forgive us any sin unless we have true contrition for it? 
God will not forgive us any sin, whether mortal or venial, unless we have true contrition for it. And we just were speaking about that, but it's, it, makes no, it makes no sense to say we're sorry and we don't plan on changing. Question 390. When is sorrow for sin true contrition? Sorrow for sin is true contrition when it is interior, supernatural, supreme, and universal. He's going to break that down for us here, but in these next couple of questions. But he does give us a scripture. This is the, the great psalm of penance, Psalm 50 of David. He won't go through the story of David with Nathan uh, and his sin, but it, it was the, the occasion of him being inspired by the Holy Ghost to say this prayer, Psalm 50. And in that, here, the priest, Philip Connell, is telling us here, this is the scripture for the support here because in this psalm, we see the interior nature of true contrition because in verse 50, it says, My sacrifice, O God, is a contrite spirit, a contrite and humbled heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. That's the interior aspect of contrition. He says the supernatural part is in verse 12. Create a pure heart for me, O God, and renew in me a steadfast spirit. It is supreme. He says the entire psalm conveys David's hatred for sin and his willingness to endure anything rather than sin again. And he says it is universal in verse 11. Turn thy face away from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Question 391. When is our sorrow interior? Our sorrow is interior when it comes from our heart and not merely from our lips. And he goes on to say that this does not mean that we have to have an emotional outburst to be able to achieve interior sorrow. That is just the body's reaction to the, our mind and will recognize the sin and being sorry for it. But we don't have to have that in our body. Some people do, obviously. St. Peter cried when our Lord looked at him after he betrayed him. Question 392. When is our sorrow, sorrow supernatural? Our sorrow is supernatural when, with the help of God's grace, it arises from motives which spring from faith and not merely from natural motives. And so he goes into say, and I'm just going to read this because it just tells it. Motives which spring from faith are truths that God has revealed. God has revealed, for example, that mortal sin will be punished in hell, venial sin in purgatory, that sin caused Christ to die, that sin is an offense against the infinite goodness of God, and that sin is hateful in itself. In itself. If we are sorry for our sins for one of these reasons, then with God's grace, our sorrow for our sin, our sorrow is supernatural. It is prompted by truths which we believe because of the authority of God who revealed them. There it is. Yeah, it goes on to say, if it's not that reason, if we're sorry for our sins because uh, we're going to get in trouble, it's bad for my health, so and so, no, thinking that way. Those are natural reasons. That's not enough. That is not fulfilling the supernatural nature of sorrow. Question 393. When is our sorrow supreme? Our sorrow is supreme when we hate sin above every other evil and are willing to endure anything rather than offend God in the future by sin. That is easy to do when we, we have the realization through prayer of how evil sin is. That is the reason why we always look at the crucifix as often as we can when we're thinking about our sins. That's what sin does. Thinking back to the lesson on, on the redemption. You know, why? Why the redemption? And he gives, gives two reasons. One is, of course, our, our Lord wanted to show how much, to what extent he loves us. That's the extent. But he also wanted to show us the evil of sin to cause that. When, question 394, when is our sorrow universal? Our sorrow is universal when we are sorry for every mortal sin which we may have had the misfortune to commit. 
And it's, you go to say, oh, of course, if, you're, if there's one mortal sin that you're not sorry for, then you're not sorry, then none of them are taken away. We have to be, that's universal. It has to be all mortal sins we're sorry for. Question 395. Should we always try to have sorrow for all our venial sins when receiving the sacrament of penance? We should try to have sorrow for all our venial sins when receiving the sacrament of penance. And when we have only venial sins to confess, we must have sorrow for at least one of them or for some sin of our past life which we confess. So there's a distinction being made here between mortal sins, because it's under, the, under this note of universal sorrow, Mortal sins, we must be sorry for all of them, universally. Venial sins, they have not taken away God's life from our soul. We, are, we do not have to be sorry for all of venial sins. It doesn't make sense not to be, though. But we're, just, we're being very clinical here. It's the class studying it. Venial sins, we do not have to have universal sorrow for venial sins. But to receive the sacrament, we must be sorry for at least one because we're not fulfilling contrition. If we, that's one of the elements of the sacrament. We have to be sorry. So we have to be sorry for at least one. Or even in that case, we have to be at least sorry for a past sin. Which is interesting. It's a sin that's already been forgiven, but we are renewing the sorrow. We're bringing the contrition that we need for the sacrament to the fore. See what's happening. Number 396. Why should we have contrition for mortal sin? We should have contrition for mortal sin because it is the greatest of all evils, gravely offends God, keeps us out of heaven, and condemns us forever to hell. And again, he gives scripture quotes here. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Uh, the unjust will not possess the kingdom of God. And we'll give the others, but it's, it's clearly there. Question 397. Why should we have contrition for venial sin? We should have contrition for venial sin because it displeases God, merits temporal punishment, and may lead to mortal sin. You can see right away why sacrament penance is recommended for just even for venial sins, because of the fact these are things we want to eliminate from our spiritual life. If we want to grow close to our Lord, this is the best way to do it, to hate even these venial sins. He just goes, he's explaining the fact that as long as a person has a moral sin on his soul, he cannot be pardoned for his venial sins. So we can, you know, I'm not going to be sorry for venial sins. I'm sorry for venial sins, but not for mortal sins. The sacrament is like, do we anything? This is interesting, as we said earlier he's in the second part, he says, a person having only venial sins on his soul can't obtain pardon for those for which he is sincerely sorry even though other venial sins remain unforgiven because he is not sorry for them. That's interesting. So we can receive the sacrament for the, just by being sorry for a venial sin, but if we're not sorry for other venial sins, they still remain. Now, that does not apply to mortal sin. We have to be sorry for all mortal sins to receive the sacrament. Number 398. How many kinds of contrition are there? There are two kinds of contrition. Perfect contrition and imperfect contrition. Number 399, when is our contrition perfect? Our contrition is perfect when we are sorry for our sins because, because sin offends God, whom we love above all things for his own sake. That gives the reason why, as if we have to explain why we should have a love for God and, and hatred for our sin. Number 400, when is our contrition imperfect? Our contrition is imperfect when we are sorry for our sins because they are hateful in themselves or because we fear God's punishment. And this imperfect contrition is also called attrition. Number 401, to receive the sacrament of penance worthily, what kind of contrition is sufficient? To receive the sacrament of penance worthily, imperfect contrition is sufficient. The sacrament perfects it. Number 402, should we always try to have perfect contrition in the sacrament of penance? We should always try to have perfect contrition in the sacrament of penance because perfect contrition is more pleasing to God and because 
with his help, we can always have it. I read that with that emphasis there on with his help, because perfect contrition demands that type of grace, response to God's grace. Because the benefits of perfect contrition, we're going to talk about here in a second, are tremendous. They can supply for the elements of the sacrament. Number 403, how can a person in mortal sin regain the state of grace before receiving the sacrament of penance? A person in mortal sin can regain the state of grace before receiving the sacrament of penance by making an act of con perfect contrition with the sincere purpose of going to confession. So, here we are in the midst of the sacramental system, and we know that tremendous em emphasis on it that we've already spoken about, but if you recall, even when we talk about the sacrament of baptism, which is essential to get to heaven, we cannot get to heaven without that sacrament. But even then, you remember, there are extra sacramental means of removing original sin, if you remember that lesson. Because God, being almighty, has given us these ordinary means of salvation, the sacraments. This contact with our Lord's human nature for all of us for all time. It is the Catholic universal church for all times, all peoples. He has given us the ordinary means. As soon as you hear that term ordinary, you think there must be some extraordinary means because God is almighty. So in the sacrament of baptism, which is critical to get to heaven, God has, has an extra sacramental way, and if you recall, baptism of blood and desire. Special grace people have to respond to, but it is available to them, if you remember that lesson. Here we see the same thing. An extra sacramental, extraordinary something outside the ordinary means of the sacraments, and it is perfect contrition. But you saw the definition, it has to be with his help. We have to respond to the actual grace given to us. He goes in to say this, that this special quality of perfect contrition is not limited, which makes sense when we're dealing with Almighty God. He says it's not limited to the moment a person is going to die. It's not that's not the only time that we should make a perfect act of contrition. It is not true that we can regain the state of grace by perfect contrition only when we are in danger of death or when it is impossible to go to confession. Danger of death or impossible to go to confession. He's telling us some people might think that that's not true. In order to regain sanctifying grace by perfect contrition, it is sufficient that we intend to go to confession the next time we are obliged to do so. Now that term there when he says we're obliged to do so, he's talking about the commandment of the church that we have to, in order to make our Easter duty, receive Holy Communion, we have to receive the sacrament of penance at least once a year. So he says there is an obligation to go to confession. He says that's when you have to confess those sins. So one of the conditions for perfect contrition is that you want to confess the sin as soon as you're able or you're obliged to. So now, we may be thinking, well, if not, we're going to bring that up. Why? Oh, well, I'll hold that for a second because he gives give us another question about that. He does give us this scripture quote from Ezekiel 18.23. And he says, during the season of Lent, this... It, it, well, it is. We have, we're talking about the term penance again. We have penances and all these things that we talk about, but we have penitential seasons in the church. The liturgy reflects this virtue of penance and everything. Saint, is it Saint Gregory the Great? I think it was Saint Gregory the Great said, the, the season of Lent is our tithe to God. Because he said we have these 40 days that we're doing extra penance out of sorrow for sin. And he says that's like our tithe. That's giving back 
10% of the year. So 365 days, we're giving back 40 days. We're giving back 10%. And he says, that's our tithe to God. So we have this penitential season. That's not the only one. We have Advent. We also have days of the year that are penitential, like the ember days. Because this is so much a part of the Christian identity that we're sorry for our sins. Christ's death means something. It saved us, but it means we caused it through our sins. So this is big. And so in the season of Lent, for example, this theme, especially we're talking about Ash Wednesday, people receiving ashes, the penitents and the catechumens, the two types of people that are singled out for the season. We're hearing constantly messages about those people through the scriptures, the texts of the masses, and the scrutinies for those who are catechumens. And here's one of those texts, Ezekiel 18.23. Is it my will that a sinner should die, saith the Lord God, and not that he should be converted from his ways and live. That's the thing. God loves us. He wants us to be sorry so we can get to heaven. He doesn't want this sin to be separating us. Question 404. What should we do if we have the misfortune to commit a mortal sin? If we have the misfortune to commit a mortal sin, we should ask God's pardon and grace at once, make an act of perfect contrition, and go to confession as soon as we can. So there it is. We don't have to wait till we're dying or we, we have no outlet to go to confession. Question 405. May we receive Holy Communion after committing a mortal sin if we merely make an act of perfect contrition? And this is the question and answer I didn't explain it until this came up here. We may not receive Holy Communion after committing a mortal sin if we merely make an act of perfect contrition. One who has sinned grievously must go to confession before receiving Holy Communion. So you can see if we parallel, by the way, we talk about the, this was in that lesson on the sacraments. We talked about the seven sacraments. There's a division of them into sacraments of the living and sacraments of the dead. There are two sacraments of the dead, five sacraments of the living. If you recall this, we're doing a little review here. But the uh, sacraments of the living, they are received by people who are already in the state of grace. A great example there is of the Holy Eucharist. You have to be in the state of grace to receive Holy Eucharist. But there are two sacraments of the dead. That means these can be received by people who are not in the state of grace. And so the two ways we can be out of state of grace, first, of course, by original sin and then by actual sin, namely mortal sin. And so you can see right away there's going to be two sacraments to take care of that. One, we just said earlier here, baptism, taking away original sin, and then sacrament penance, taking care of mortal sins committed after baptism. So because there are these two sacraments of the dead, these there's a parallel here, which we've already drawn upon, that the fact that there's an extra sac sacramental way of a person having original sin taken off his soul, and we talk about baptism and blood and desire. In the sacrament of penance, we have perfect contrition. But if you remember, those al alternative ways of having original sin removed do not give us all the benefits of the sacrament. This is a review, but remember, you don't receive the character and, and so on. Here's an example of the difference here. We do have our sins taken away by perfect contrition, but here's one of the drawbacks to this extra sacramental means of sanctification, and that is we cannot receive Holy Communion. Now, he doesn't go into this here except a little bit over here in the, uh, the important truths, so we're going to explain this a little bit here. Why is that? I mean, we can say right away, well, it's just as a parallel with baptism, there's one here. But the reason why, and we didn't stress this as much, we said it because when we told about what the sacrament is. We said, what is that outward sign that these things must be made known, perceptible? This is by, by our ears, the priests, people could around could hear it. That is how the sacrament, the outward sign is being expressed. But that is also because it is inside the words of our Lord when he gave the sacrament. He said, 
Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. Whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. That's the command that our Lord gave to the apostles and through them, the bishops and the priests down through the ages, right? What does that mean? I didn't break this down. This, the answer is already gave it to us, but we, we have to break down, unpack our Lord's words. When he says, the sins that you forgive, the question is, how are those apostles going to know what those sins are? Since the person has to express the sin for the, for the priest to either remove the sin or retain the sin. Retain was what we talked about earlier where the priest cannot absolve them because he sees that the integrity of the sacrament is not being fulfilled. We gave the example. So how can the priest do that if he does not know what the sins are. So you see, obviously, what's implied there, when our Lord gave that command, he is also commanding people to tell sins to the apostles, to tell sins to the priests, because otherwise the priest cannot forgive or retain. He has no knowledge of what's going on unless someone tells him. That essential quality, which of course we understand is the contrition and the confession of the sacrament, which we already talked about, you see, that element of the sacrament is missing in the example of perfect contrition. The person has, by perfect contrition, has had grace restored to him, but he has not yet fulfilled the command of God to express those sins to the priest. So yes, he has sanctified grace, but he cannot now come up to another sacrament particular the whole Eucharist. He cannot do that without fulfilling that obligation for perfect removal of the sin. The sin is removed. We talked about the grace being given. But the ability to receive other sacraments, again, we're, okay, I have to go back to that parallel just because I, I, I skipped this, but it, really it's essential. You see, when we were talking about baptism, we said that there, there are things that the sacrament gives that the Baptism, blood, desire, do not give. And I, I just meant in character, I just stop, you know. But one of the things is, I kind of bring it up here because we have to take parallel. Without the sacrament of baptism, you cannot receive any other sacrament. I don't know if you remember that. So, in the case of a person who by a baptism of desire has had, and this is a special grace and everything, if a person like that, usually the case we're talking about, of course, is someone who is at the moment of death, but let's say they have, they have corresponded with God's grace and they have received the baptism of desire where uh, the more original sin has been taken off their soul, but then they survive something, you know, that crisis. Well, okay, they've had original sin removed, but now they want to they receive Holy Communion. They must be baptized to receive the sacrament. Here's the parallel. The person, by perfect contrition, has had mortal sins removed from the soul, received grace, but they also must fulfill the obligation to confess their sins. And that's why this in here, a long explanation, but you can, the reason why I go into it now just to say this, but because it's expressing that scripture where it's right in there, because it's so maligned today, I don't know how many times you have heard it, but I, you know, I have heard it. Because going to confession is, it's not easy. I mean, no one wants to admit they're wrong in anything. I mean, that's just the way it is. It's, you know, pride and everything. Uh, and, it's, and that's going to come up in the next lessons of, you know, in, in the lesson on confession, why the, the good benefits of that. So we're not, we'll save that for the next lesson. But just here, no one likes to do that. So people rebel against it and just say, we don't have to, the way they say I don't have to tell my sins to any man. I, t I tell my sins directly to God. But that's why we're going to a little bit about that scripture because our Lord said, he's telling them, you must, to, re to retain or forgive sins, you must make them known to the priest. If you want to follow our Lord perfectly, do what he's asking. Confess your sins. Number 406. What is the firm purpose of sinning no more? 
The firm purpose of sinning no more is the sincere resolve not only to avoid sin, but to avoid as far as possible the near occasions of sin. And we know that those are persons, places, and things that lead us into sin. We, we talked about that. We talked about the whole nature of sin. And you can see, once again, we gave that example about the thief. Well, the priest can see he's not willing to give up those occasions, being around cars and the like. That, that means he's not, he doesn't have a firm purpose. And our Lord, he gives a quote from St. John chapter 8, verse 11. Then Jesus said, this is about the woman taking adultery. Neither will I condemn thee, condemn thee. Go thy way, and from now on, sin no more. There's the firm purpose. Question 407. What purpose of amendment must a person have if he has only venial sins to confess? If a person has only venial sins to confess, he must have the purpose of avoiding at least one of them. And we talked about that. So that's the purpose there. Now, in the... Important truths, we just want to mention these, these couple of things here. Because people can say, well, we want to always have, I'm going to make a comment about that in just a second. Obviously, we always want to have perfect contrition for our sins. But some people might say, well, I don't want to just be sorry for my sins because I, I can go to hell for that. You know, that's, that's not good. Well, it's not, it's not perfect, but it's attrition, it's imperfect contrition, it's all it's necessary for the sacrament of penance. And we have our Lord saying, that's, that's okay. And here it is. Yet our Lord proposed this as a good motive of contrition when he said, he, he said, this is good. Even imperfect contrition is good. When he said, be afraid of him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. That's St. Luke chapter 12, verse 5. So he's telling us that that's a good motive. You don't want to go ahead, go to hell. It's a supernatural motive. It's not natural motive because I, you know, I'll hurt my health that way. He does give a little comment here about perfect contrition in support of why this is, is a reality too. It was on this contrition that our Lord spoke when he said, pointing to the repentant sin sinner, St. Mary Magdalene, her sins, many as they are, shall be forgiven her because she has loved much. And that's St. Luke chapter 7, verse, 40, verse 47. Now, the last thing we just wanted to point out, and I just say this little thing. Well, providential, I guess. I wanted to just pull out a uh, little bookmark for this here. I just opened my desk drawer, and here is the, what I pulled out. And uh, I'm smiling and everything, because if you're familiar with this, if, well, you can't probably read it from there. This is St. John Nepomucene. St. John Nepomucene was a priest in the 14th century in Bohemia, and he was the uh, chaplain to the court. So he heard the confessions and took care of the spiritual needs of the people. Well, the king wanted to know what was going on in his court. And he brought this priest in and said, in particular, what is my wife telling you? And the priest said, I can't tell you that. Now, this is something we haven't talked about. This come up later in the, in the ceremony. We talk about the seal of confession, but uh, the priest is, can never say anything he's heard. We all know that. We haven't talked about it here. It gets in the next lesson. Um, and this priest, I can't say that. And the, the king had him killed. He's a martyr for the sacrament. Just like we have martyrs for all the other sacraments, here's the martyr. And I just, you know, so his feast day is May 16th. Here's his prayer. And then the little booklet goes in to tell his story. But this is St. John Nepomucene. Uh, the great patron of the Seal of Confession. And what we were marking is this. This is the act of contrition that we say at the end of, the, of our sacrament of penance. And I'll emphasize these points here because you're going to hear all of the elements. That's why the priest will say to everyone, we're supposed to say after we leave the confessional, but he will make sure the person makes the act of contrition right in the confessional because he is listening. The priest is the guardian of the validity, as we talked about. He's listening for that contrition, that the confession had already been done, and the satisfaction, that those elements, okay? And I'm going to stop when we hear some of these things being said. Oh my God, I am heartily sorry, there's our sorrow, for having offended thee, 
And I detest all my sins. There's the virtue of penance. I hate these sins. Because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell. There's the imperfect contrition. Because I, this supernatural truth, I'm not going to get to heaven. I'm going to go to hell. There's a supernatural truth. We, he talks about imperfect contrition, you see, being a little bit selfish. It's, we're looking out for our own motives. But they are supernatural motives. That's all we need. But most of all, because they offend thee, my God, who art all good and deserving of all my love, there's perfect contrition. I know I got, this is what they can do, but this is what I really am, because this is what is done to you. I love you. Now, I firmly resolve, with the help of thy grace, to confess my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. It's all right there. You, you, you hear it. I confess, I do penance, and I make the resolution to amend my life. Amen. So that's all done in the Sire of Penance, but he goes on to stress in here the prime importance of, of perfect contrition and using the act of contrition. At the end of every day, we always say morning offering in the morning and the act of contrition at the end of the day, and we should pray. It only takes, how long does it take just to read that? But we have to have responded to God's grace to make it meaningful. At the end of the day, sorry for our sins, take a moment, look at the crucifix, and say the act of contrition. We can always go to sleep in the state of grace. And if we use holy water, it enhances that. So we encourage everyone to go to this hour of repentance, make perfect acts of contrition whenever possible, and encourage others. This is not a sacrament of dread and doom. This is a great sacrament. It's coming right from the sacred heart. There's no reason for us, any, anyone to, in any way, have inhibitions about it. If we do, it's the devil trying to block us. Okay, that's all for now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Amen.